Recording will start. I believe we are recording. Yes. So, good afternoon. <laughs> you are? I'm Anne Marie Apple. I sit on the CLDR Technical Committee, and this is Marcus. I'm Marcus Scherer. I sit on the ICU Technical Committee and also the Properties and Algorithms Group. That's lots of ads inside of Google and things like that. And we're here to give an update on CLDR and ICU after a couple of years since the last conference. Um, first, with a little introduction on <clears throat> where this came from and so that you understand where, where oh, I'm clicking at the wrong thing. Of where we come from, what the context is. So the first few slides are not actually what's new. The first few slides just set the scene. Um, so we are talking about Unicode standards. And the core level of that, we have the Unicode encoding, um, which is really something that we all take for granted now. But it's the first time that we in the industry have had a way of lossless uh, dealing with text in, in, in any language and having any one computer do that for all languages at the same time. 20 years ago, that was a big deal, and we were still trying to convince people to use it. At this point, we, uh, we basically have Unicode everywhere, so that's a good thing. Together with that, Unicode allows us to do text processing and do a lot of other things that we need in order to uh, Get our, help, help our users get stuff done. And we've had a bit of an introduction earlier today already that this also come with, comes with not just um, a lot of characters that are in the standard, but also a lot of specifications of how to work with them, data for doing that, test data for getting it right, um, and then also associated standards so that you can just input and display text, but you can also sort it and use it in domain names and have security issues uh, relatively well under control. A lot of that, what, what we really call the Unicode standard or the collection of standards, still mostly um, is designed to get a good answer for everything all at once. But then, of course, we have to do certain things in a language-specific way, and that's where CLDR gives us the data for lots and lots of languages in many different ways. So we have a large number of specifications. We have a large core spec to begin with, with multiple annexes and associated standards. We have almost 150,000 characters at this point in Unicode and growing. Uh, we have dozens of properties to go with many different algorithms that we need in order to have consistent behavior between implementations. In CLDR, we have data for many, many languages. We have about 95 for which we have comprehensive data, which means the languages are ready for full UI localization. We have diff uh, many different sort orders, different conversion tables, and these things get updated every year. Um, so how do you deal with that? There's a lot of complexity here and a lot of good functionality. Um, well, we are offering you the standards and data. We are offering you more standards and data with CLDR. And then we are also offering you um, Unicode sponsored projects that actually implement these things. And you can call APIs to make these things work. And then. <clears throat> A lot of these kinds of technologies and libraries get used in operating systems themselves or in applications that package um, parts of these things so that uh, you get the benefit of all that Unicode has to offer. And so I should, I don't know, does everyone know what these abbreviations mean? internationalization and localization, um, getting software ready to work in all languages potentially and localization for actually 
going to each of the languages. And of course, we are too lazy to say these long words, so we abbreviate them in funny ways. But really, we are giving you ways of um, doing sorting and searching and bidirectional text handling and all these things by <clears throat> using our libraries, using our technologies, using the standards that we produce. So you don't have to try to figure all of these things out on your own and uh, implement these from scratch. We do try, if possible, to make things uh, work relatively fast. <clears throat> Some of our algorithms, we had to kind of compete with all the implementations that were much simpler and, and had much simpler algorithms. So sometimes we had to work a bit to get something that people wanted to adopt, even though uh, when you work with 100,000 characters, it's a little harder to do than working with 100 or 1,000 characters. Um, <clears throat> we are also always looking at, at footprint, and we actually have a new product that is especially focused on that. But um, <clears throat> in the end, what we produce needs to fit on your phone, on your device, on your server, and your app. Um, otherwise, it's not useful. And then we have CLDR. OK, so now we'll talk about CLDR. Uh, so this is kind of a brief overview of the CLDR structure. So to start with, there's the LDML, the Locale Data Markup Language, which kind of describes the structure. Then there's actually the linguistic data and metadata. And here are some examples, the patterns for formatting. There's all the translations for the language names, regions. There's regional information. There's keyboard layouts. There's a lot more there. Um, one of the big things that CLDR does is it has a open submission period at least once annually, which allows people to crowdsource and curate the data. So, um, one of the kind of most common examples of where you may see this is uh, emoji annotations. You need a way to describe emojis across all languages. So. There's both the emoji name, but also keywords as well. So, um, Another part of CLDR is CLDR does produce uh, a JSON version, which is used by a bunch of different internationalization libraries and more. Um, the data is available in zip files or via NPM or other package managers, and so it's resolved so that you don't have to, that people don't have to do uh, as much processing. Sorry, I'm moving fast since. That's okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so then we have ICU. So that's the set of libraries that we have in Java, C++, and C. And actually, another slide will talk about another version of that kind of functionality. ICU currently stands for International Components for Unicode. Uh, the original name actually was something different. It really started in, I guess, the mid-90s as part of the joint venture between Apple and IBM that tried to make the next greatest operating system with all new fancy technologies. And part of those fancy technologies was to make it work for <clears throat> as many languages as possible learning from what IBM and Apple had created before. In fact, the early Java 1.1 internationalization support came from that team. Um, that was 98, I think. Um, and then IBM kind of absorbed what was left of their joint venture and started promoting the IBM classes for Unicode. That became IBM's first open source project in 1999. That's also when I joined the team. I'm excited to see that there are two people in the room that interviewed me for that. Um, and then we were looking for a new name because it wasn't just classes. It also had C APIs, and it wasn't just IBM, or it was open source. So we uh, kept the acronym, but we changed the name to something a little more neutral. Um, and then 
of course, that kept being developed. We had an active team. We still have an active team of people that work on that continually. Part of what we had was a growing collection of locale data, partly sourced from IBM, partly from bug reports and other feedback and contributions we got. And we split that off into a separate project. And that became a Unicode project relatively early. And that became CLDR. So the origins of that also come from the RCU project. And then in the meantime, of course, we have kept developing, but we also moved the project, which for a long time was IBM sponsored. We eventually moved it itself to become a, a Unicode project. So now it is under the Unicode license, Unicode sponsorship. Um, we've moved through various stages of online repositories. We are now on GitHub and Jira. We have, of course, also upgraded to newer versions of the programming languages that we work with. In the early days, it was basically Java 1, Java 2, and, and things like that. C++ was very painful 20 years ago. That's getting a little better. So we are trying to keep up with Unicode, with the needs of our contributors and, and users, and with the uh, computing environment as a whole. And then there is a sibling project that's about three years old now. It's called ICU for X, the X kind of being the uh, variable for anything that, that you might want. Um, it's written in Rust. It's kind of a reimagined version of a fair subset of the ICU functionality. It's still growing. Um, it's a little bit different. It doesn't do some of the things deliberately that ICU has been doing, but it's really focused on uh, basically being able to be deployed on a wider range of devices, really learning from some of the things that we can no longer undo because we can't remove functionality that some of our users have been using. Uh, they are basically starting from a clean sheet and have been designing it so that you can really slice what, what you want to use and get just the minimum amount of code and data that you need to do that. And I have done um, a fairly impressive job on that. This one is written in Rust, but there are um, fast function interface wrappers for multiple programming languages so that it can be used in a variety of environments. Um, so that's something that is relatively new and is a strong but not a one-to-one -one overlap between the C, C++, and Java versions on one hand and the UIC effects on the other hand. There are more details about that in a session, I think. Tomorrow. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, but at the same workshop. And we have, over time, sort of increased the number that we have on this kind of slide. Um, if you're using a computing device, pretty much of any type, you're probably using one or more versions of ICU or subsets of ICU as part of the operating system, as part of major apps, probably part of your browser. Um, there are wrappers for the older versions of the libraries into multiple languages. Uh, some years ago, we were notified that one of the uh, car stereo uh, OEMs was using ICU in, in their system. So pretty much everywhere. And with ICU for X, I think we will get some more exposure there too. So what's new? So partly what's happening is that there are new versions of base standards all the time. <clears throat> There's new Unicode version once a year. There is a new time zone data version uh, several times a year, typically. And we all, of course, provide through our date formatting and calendar and time zone APIs, we provide access to that kind of thing. So we need to keep up to date. There are new language codes, new script codes. The world is changing. We keep updating the library so that you have to do the newest and latest functionality in order to work 
with languages and writing systems as well as interact with other software out in the industry. So as a result, we have typically two releases of CLDR and ICU a year. And we typically try to actually release roughly on the same day because we are kind of tied at the hip with the data and the code and implementation and specifications um, so that you have a coherent experience. We don't follow one of the, the other with a long lead time. Um, for examples of what's new in the last couple of years, we have new versions of Unicode with several thousand more characters. As usual, when we have thousands of characters, most of the characters in terms of numbers are Chinese characters uh, because people keep finding names and databases, for example, that are needed in order to represent the name of a person and the name of a, a town somewhere or someone finds an older dictionary with characters that haven't been encoded yet. But there are also a couple of new scripts uh, for modern languages and uh, older languages. There are a couple extra characters that uh, expand the language coverage for existing scripts. We have a number of new emoji. We also had this time uh, over the last year um, new versions of a Chinese standard that companies that want to do business in China have to implement. And we had to make adjustments for that. And that is relatively important for any of those kinds of companies. So we have some adjusted data for that. And we've worked uh, some, some changes into CLE and ICU for that stuff. We also had a talk earlier today about security mechanisms. We have a whole new uh, spec for dealing with Unicode in source code in order to prevent people from being confused or worse. And we have some new APIs for that in ICU. Um, and we have a little bit more work coming there. We also have improvements in Unicode for line breaking on finite grain boundaries. The problem is that for some languages, uh, their writing system doesn't use spaces between words. And we typically need to handle that with a dictionary or some kind of machine learning algorithm so that we can break up longer runs of letters into meaningful chunks. Um, but that tends to favor larger languages for which we have more resources. Um, but it turns out for some writing systems like Javanese and Balinese, it makes sense to actually do line breaking opportunities on syllable boundaries and syllable boundaries are pretty easy to figure out. So we can do a better job in laying out um, text in writing systems that otherwise might not get good support for a long time. And then we have. Okay, so there's been four CLD, four major CLDR releases since the last time there was a what's new talk. Um, there's been two limited cycles and two regular submission cycles. As you can see, there's a couple of themes. Pretty much every uh, release has um, spec improvements and a lot of tooling improvements for the survey tool. Um, Additionally, um, 41 had improvements in kind of unit, and we also changed uh, what is required in core data so that more languages could start contributing to become basic. Um, 42 was the real start of data contribution for person names. Um, then 43 had some, well, we actually did a dot release 43.1 for the GB 1830, um, mm -hmm. that Marcus had mentioned, uh, just a couple of slides ago. And then on the most recent one, which just released last week, um, there's more support for grammatical features. There's also the keyboard spec rewrite, which we'll talk about a bit further down. So um, we have been focusing on doing a lot of CLDR spec improvements and adding test data so that uh, 
implementations can check to make sure that they're following the spec. Um, so as you can see, a lot of stuff has been coming up through ICU for X actually implementing stuff. Um, if you wanna learn more about the conformance test data, there was a talk on it. Uh, the, the talk is prove it data driven conformance testing. We've also been uh, updating the spec about inheritance and locality identifiers, units, and of course the spec will continue to evolve. So one big question is how many languages are we at? So at, in uh, CLDR 44, we have 94, 95 languages at modern, which is where you can do the full UI localization. There's 13 that are now at moderate, uh, which is document content. And this is not locales. These are like full languages, right? Um, and then 50 now at basic. And we've had a great increase uh, due to the, the new digital, digitally disadvantaged languages subcommittee, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, so here's some of the examples of new locales. We especially had a lot of, uh, of languages advanced in this most recent from India, Africa, and North America, a lot through community engagement. Um, they were included in the recent version of ICU if they had at least basic data support or basic coverage. Um, we've also been adding support for things like uh, Romanized Hindi, um, which is kind of a form of Hinglish um, because we don't, it's not recommended to do cross script fallback. It does fall back to Indian English instead of Hindi Devanagari. So. Yeah, and then we had some, some work done on line breaking for major languages, Japanese and Korean. Um, the issue there is that when you do too big line breaking, it is good in most languages for any kind of text, but in Japanese and Korean in particular, it's uh, you, you actually do a different style of line breaking between longer pieces of text and short pieces of text, especially titles and headings. And so um, if you have short pieces of text, it doesn't, it didn't used to flow like those kinds of users expected. And we had work done uh, to Especially to first of all figure out what what is the behavior that we want, what do we call it, how do we trigger it, how do we select it? So we ended up in our spec calling it a, the phrase based breaking, uh, initially based on uh, what this is called and how it's understood in Japanese. Um, so that's something that you would want to use in uh, short forms of text, uh, like like window titles or something like that. And we have in ICU a machine learning model from another open source project uh, that we could port and, and use there. We also have a version of that in Korean, which is uh, relatively simple in that case because Korean does use spaces usually. So we take those as a proxy for word boundaries. Um, so that has been added recently and I believe in Android, there's actually built-in support to select one or the other in some cases mm -hmm. to make that happen nicely. Yeah, I'm still personally waiting for when they do this in English and I don't have to modify my titles. They just... <laughs> All right. Um, we've heard, maybe you, you managed to attend that talk from, from Addison. We've heard about message format two. Um, that is created by a working group under the guidance of the CLER Technical Committee. They are still working on finalizing the standard. He said this morning that they hope to get this into the next CLDR release. Uh, it's been three years, I believe, so far. Trying Something to, like that. Trying to get there. Uh, last year, it looked relatively settled so we have a what we call a technology preview api so it's kind of with with uh with caveats of 
any anything here could change, but we have an API where people could play with the state of the art uh, as of last year with the syntax and the framework and semantics that were available at that time. It looks like the syntax has recently changed though from uh, what there was, so we will have to uh, go back and adjust the implementation. Um, <clears throat> but that's something that's in ICU for Java currently. We don't yet have it in C++. We were slow walking the C++ version because it, the, the standard wasn't settled yet, so it didn't seem to make sense to jump into getting into a second programming language there. Um, but <clears throat> we hope that's coming fairly soon now. Back to you. Okay. Uh, then the person named formatting, there have been in the past couple of years, there's been a lot of growth in the person name formatting, both in defining the expected behavior and, um, and having the betters contribute data um, for what's expected. So it's supported for all the languages that are at modern. And it has a ICU4j draft API. So. Yes, and draft is better than technology preview in a way. Draft, we think we have figured out how to make an API for that, but we always give ourselves a year of time before we call it stable, because when it's stable in our libraries, we basically never change it um, so that you don't have to rewrite your applications when you upgrade to a new version of ICU. So. When it's draft, we still have some wiggle rooms. Things might still change, but we mostly think it's probably about right. Um, so this is usable now, and it doesn't look like that one is changing dramatically. So hopefully we mm -hmm. basically will have the API stable in the next release or two. Yeah. And the CLR data is getting better and better for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next thing that happened is in 44, there was a rewrite of the keyboard spec. It has been in progress for a while now um, from the keyboard subcommittee. Um, so it's in tech preview and it is to help it make it make it easier for people to contribute a layout for their language and make it so that platforms can easily adopt. Um, so if you'd like to learn more, you can go to the keyboard work group site and take a look at the spec, play with the play with the examples while it's in tech preview. So and then earlier I alluded to the new subcommittee. We also started this year a digitally disadvantaged language subcommittee to help the advancement of digitally disadvantaged languages because otherwise people would contribute data and the languages wouldn't necessarily make it to basic. Um, in CLDR, there's a concept of guest fetters and they don't have enough vote power to advance their data. So this committee is to help them advance and also to help communities on board and be able to start contributing through the tool, right? Um, so we actually did have quite a few new languages advance uh, to basic, which means they were included in ICU this year. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like to learn more, we have a, a DDL page, so. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we have, kind of big feature additions and, and pieces of work that are easy to talk about. Sometimes we have work more like under the covers or um, smaller refinements. We don't always have the next message format version. We don't always have the next, oh, now we format personal names. Um, but we have, for example, had in the industry a long history of basically using typewriter style spacing in our formats and there was always a discussion, well, I want the space between the, the, the time and the AM PM, but it's really wide looking and it should be a smaller one. And eventually CLDR said, well, we really should be following modern typography. We really have Unicode with uh, lots of variations and we are using improved 
patterns now for more pleasing styling. Uh, this, this is partly interesting for anyone who is using our libraries and our standards because if you are, probably your unit tests were failing because people were expecting the old behavior. Uh, that was pretty visible in the work that we had to do in, in adopting the new versions at the time. Um, but there are also other things where things change just to make them more robust, make them more colloquial, make them work better for uh, certain use cases and environments. We have, for example, more robust number formatting for Arabic. Uh, we have better data for and more data for what is the default script or the default country region for a language. And there are lots and lots of languages, so we need really a lot of data for that kind of thing. We have added uh, more measurement units and data for them, display data for them, conversions between measurement units. There has been a lot of work in the last couple of years. And various other things that uh, are sort of part of the ongoing work that we do in making our libraries better and making our specifications better. I'm starting to get some, some signals on timing here. Um, I don't think we have a lot of slides left. Mm -hmm. There are things that are even less visible. They're not even necessarily feature work uh, that you can observe very much, but we keep working on memory management in C, C++ in particular. That is always a familiar thing to look at. Um, we are using more and more fuzzer testing so that we can find problems and fix them before other people do. Um, we have other kinds of C++ health checks. Um, we have changed the Java build system. We are planning to change the C++ build system in the next year. Uh, we are also trying to upgrade to yet newer versions of C++ so that we can use more advanced features there. We are also looking at uh, various other things. So inheritance resolution for local data has improved. That also let us then remove some of the redundant data, which should help with the data size, but also clarified um, what really uh, was intended to be used for regional variants of languages, which sometimes was a little unclear. Um, I think that's mostly that. Um, I added this slide also because not everything is absolutely perfect. Um, in particular, since these libraries are 25 plus years old to some degree, um, some of the APIs are a bit old fashioned. Um, it's hard for us to just replace APIs because again, we have users that use what we have, but we are looking at uh, ways to use new features of languages and new ways of doing things and make it more convenient to use ICU than it has been. Um, we also want to modernize further on the internal side so that code is more robust, easier to work with, either easier to contribute to. We have a large backlog of things that we would like to do if we had 100 more people to work on this thing. Uh, we have some bugs to look at which I think that we do a pretty good job on critical bugs, but there are uh, lesser things that we could improve. And our documentation and samples are sometimes long in the tooth. So there's lots more work that could be done, would, would like to be done. And, and we have our obligatory where to find us slide, which has all the resources on how to find the two technical committees. So in both projects so and that's the end i there. believe that is the end and yep. we have some time manish is grabbing a microphone there's another one i think everyone's waiting for coffee maybe <laughs> you had a question We need to do these annually so that the, the, the amount of stuff to go through is shorter. Yeah. <laughs>
Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding the CLDR. Uh, we have a ticket there. I've been mm -hmm. staying there like uh, a year and a half. I don't know what is the process. Uh, so generally it depends on the ticket. So yes. there are languages where one of the CLDR or Unicode organizations yes. will contribute vetters. And for those ones, we can generally um, have kind of language specialists review it. For yeah. other tickets, uh, can I open the, the, can we go to the GitHub and, uh, So for the other ones, I think sometimes what tends to slow down tickets getting resolved is, um, is we need to, verify the feedback. So we actually have kind of, I don't know how readable this is, but if you, if you um, look at this, does it not, how do I, oh, I know. Yeah, there we go. So if you are requesting locale updates through a ticket, I think the most helpful thing to do is to um, make sure that we have all the data up front so that it's easy for us to validate because that's usually where these tickets get stuck is um, we don't have experts for every language because we deal with contributions. But I think if you'd like afterwards, um, we can talk about which ticket it is and okay. I can tag it so that we can look at it. Okay, thank you. Yep. I, I just have a question about the general CLDR planning pro progress process. Like, do you, at the beginning of the year, decide what to do for the next year, or it's more driven by tickets or clients or? Mark, do you want to speak to that? Uh, yeah, it's actually both. Um, a lot of times we'll have a particular theme and we'll, because it helps to kind of correlate the work that we do, and we'll look through and sort of gather in items that are related to that theme and have a concerted uh, work on that. And there's a lot of the CLDR work is go to support the survey tool. And we have a couple of contract engineers who work on that under direction. And that's a big part of what they do is we identify sort of a usability ish set of usability issues and they work on that or so forth. The particular features in CLDR depend a lot upon what our member organizations want. And so people will propose and then we'll take a look at them and see, does this make sense to make this change? And they can be either, you know, big features that involve a lot of work or, or just small features like th life in space. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your talk. And if you folks have more questions, please corner them after this. Yeah.